of the Lord is here indeed. Amen. Y'all almost wiped me out singing like that. I almost didn't make it up here. Y'all can turn to one person around you, tell them what's up, and then you can be seated. <laughs> welcome, Rock City Church. Not just in the room, welcome to y'all, but also Short North, Polaris, Whitehall, if you're joining us online or on television or from a correctional facility, wherever you're joining us from, we are so grateful to God that you chose to worship with us today. My name is Patrick and I'm on staff here in the worship department, which means that I usually get to lead worship by singing with you. But today, Pastor Chad's given me the opportunity to lead worship by opening the word of God and walking through it with you. So thank you, Pastor Chad, for the opportunity, for the responsibility of that. Y'all, if you don't know by now, we have incredible leaders and pastors in this church, all throughout this church. And so much of that starts with Pastor Chad and Katie. So let's honor them for a few seconds at every location. Well, we are in week two of our series entitled Jesus Talks, where we're walking through some of the parables of Jesus. These are short stories that Jesus told to communicate profound truths. And Pastor Dave went into that a little bit more in depth last week when he started us off with a great message on a parable of potential. So today we're going to keep the ball rolling and jump into a, a parable of Jesus. But before we do, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you guide us into all truth by your spirit and through your word, Lord. Protect us from error. Open our ears that we may hear, our eyes that we may see, and soften our hearts that we may understand, embrace, and live out the truth of your word, God. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray, amen. <sighs> Y'all, I'm so humbled to be back up here. I feel like it was just yesterday I had the opportunity to teach on worship, but I actually went back, looked at the tape, looked at the date. It was way back in October that I was last up here. In fact, in October, I put a picture up of my family and it looked like this. Aww. <laughs> well, hold on now, it gets better. Now, that same family looks like this. Aww. Yes, yes, those two adorable little ultrasound babies from the first picture are now adorable little infant baby girls. We love them, we're so grateful for them, but that doesn't happen in just a day. So it's been a while since I've been up here. Time really does fly. They tell me once you have kids, it goes even faster, but I'm only five months in, so time will tell. But I have learned a couple things after having children. A lot changes when you have kids, as many of you know. The first thing is obvious, you sleep less. Everybody knows that. But something a lot of people don't know is that you develop this superpower when you have babies especially. When you walk into a room with your babies, you have the ability to simultaneously be the center of attention and also somehow completely invisible. You'll walk into the room with your babies and people will shriek and they'll howl and they'll swarm you, but they don't look at you at all. They don't speak to you, they're just looking at the baby and talking to the baby. It's, it's actually remarkable, it's unbelievable. Another thing that changes a lot when you have babies is your outfits. <laughs> Parents know what I'm talking about. Babies are selfish little people and they don't care if you just put your shirt on, you're about ready to walk out the door for work and you pick them up for five seconds just to tell them how much you love them, they will throw up all down the front of your shirt, smile at you like they just did the most adorable thing in the world. A lot changes. Your responsibilities change. Things that used to be somewhat important are now very important when you have children. Boring things, like life insurance. Don't worry, I'm not here to sell you life insurance. I'm just saying, it's kind of important once you have kids. And that's what we were told when we found out, my wife and I found out we were having twins, we were like, Somebody gave us some strong advice. You should really get some life insurance. And I go, that, sir, is an excellent idea. I will definitely do that today. <laughs> it slipped my mind. Then we were creeping up on the due date, and the same person was like, hey, you should really think about that life insurance. I'm like, yo, definitely going to do that. As soon as I get off the phone with you, I'm going to call them. I'm going to get the ball rolling. I did not get the ball rolling. Kept slipping my mind and slipping my mind. The babies are born, still slipping my mind until I get on a plane. I'm about ready to take off. I always get a little nervous on planes, but today I went, oh no. <laughs> I never got the life insurance. 
I'm like, this plane, it could go down. If it goes down, obviously, I'm in it. I'm going down with it. I haven't set up my family financially. We're going to lose the house we just bought. We're going to have to move out of the neighborhood that we love. My wife and kids are somehow going to end up homeless. I don't know how. I'm just thinking worst case scenario. And I'm doing what we all do in these situations. I'm making a deal with God. It's bad theology, but we do it. Let's be honest. I'm like, God, if you please just let me out of this situation, get me there safely. I promise I'm going to do the responsible thing. I'm going to get the life insurance. God, in his mercy, he dropped the plane down very gently on the ground, and I got hooked up with some life insurance. Hallelujah. But not without a whole lot of unnecessary stress, all because I procrastinated. I procrastinated. Now, I'm going to be honest with you all. This wasn't the first time I procrastinated. Nor was it the last. It's something that I've struggled with on and off throughout my life, mostly on. And I'm, I'm willing to bet I'm not the only one in the room who struggles with procrastination. If you struggle with procrastination, why don't you raise your hand? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Some of y'all get around to it later. Here's how you know. <laughs> Here's how you know if you struggle with procrastination. If, you, if you've ever said, I'm not putting it off, I just work better under pressure. <laughs> You're a procrastinator. You are a poor planner. You don't love pressure. You hate planning. But I'm not here to judge you. As I just said, I do that too, right? We're all in the same boat, at least most of us. I know that about me. You know that about you. And Jesus knows that about all of us, right? He knows human nature. We have the tendency to misprioritize, to put off, to lose sight of what's really important and what's urgent, which is why he gave the parable that we're going to look to to his disciples, because we all have the tendency to get a little lax, to let our foot come off the gas. And so the parable that we're looking at today is found in three places, three of the Gospels, Matthew 24, Luke 12, and 21. It's split up in the book of Luke and in Mark 13. And we're going to be working mostly out of the book of Mark today. So the backstory for this parable, Jesus has come into Jerusalem for Passover. It's a huge festival, and Jews from all over the world would gather in Jerusalem. And Jesus is coming to Jerusalem, but he knows in just a few days he's going to be giving his life on the cross. And he spends these days teaching in the temple, turning over tables in the temple, a lot of really great stuff. And then in Mark chapter 13, he begins to prophesy to his disciples. And he's prophesying about two really big events. First is the destruction of the Jewish temple which would have been devastating for his disciples to hear. It was the center of Jewish life and worship. But then he also prophesies about another, a second greater day of judgment. And in the chapter, he's switching back and forth between the two days of judgment. And if that sounds confusing, it's because it is. It is confusing. If you read through the chapter, it's a little confusing. And there's some debate about when Jesus is talking about what and what details apply to which day. But first he opens a chapter telling about his disciples about the destruction of the temple. And this, again, was devastating to them. So they say, when will this happen? What signs can we look out for? Jesus begins to tell them of tribulations and trials and family members handing over family members to be killed and earthquakes and all of these horrible things. He tells his disciples that you will be dragged to the courts and beaten. People will hate you for my name's sake. He speaks of the abomination of desolation. Now that just sounds scary, y'all the abomination of desolation. And he's referring to a prophecy from the book of Daniel. And in in the book of Luke, he explains it a little bit further. He's saying that the Roman army will surround the city of Jerusalem and destroy the temple. That's what he's prophesying about. And a few decades later, in the year 70 AD, all of that came to pass. Because Jesus always tells the truth. Amen? He always tells the truth. But then he switches and starts talking about another Day of judgment. And we're going to pick up in verse 24. He says to his disciples, In those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars of heaven will fall and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. They will see the Son of Man, that's Jesus, coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels, gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest parts of the heaven. This is Jesus' first big point of emphasis for his disciples, and it's this. Jesus says, I am coming back. He says, I'm coming back. Jesus knows he's going to be crucified. He knows he's going to resurrect and he's going to ascend into heaven and sit at the right hand of the Father and reign from heaven. He knows that, but he's saying, hey, I'm coming back. And for many of us, the second coming of Jesus fills us with hope and with joy. We're looking forward to it with great expectation, and we should 
Because we know that when Jesus comes back, he will rid the world of sin and wickedness once and for all. He will restore creation to its original glory. He will finalize the establishment of his kingdom, which will never end. And for those who put their faith in Jesus, he invites us to inherit that kingdom and live with him forever in shalom. That's peace and harmony, everything made right. He will wipe away our every tear, undo every wrong thing done. He will reverse every painful effect that sin has ever had on our lives. We will be finally free from temptation, free from sin, from addiction and sickness, free to see Christ in all of his glory, to worship him, to know him. Everything that we were created for will be ours forever, forever. But there is another side to the story. There is a scenario in which the return of Jesus might not fill us with hope, but with fear. And it should. Because Jesus is coming back to judge sin once and for all. And what does that say about me if I refuse to let go of my own sin? If I refuse to surrender my life to Christ and ask him to cleanse me, forgive me, and to separate me from my sin? If I insist on holding tightly onto my sin and the righteous judgment of God is poured out on my sin, I am going down with it. See, the sober fact is this. When Jesus comes back and we all meet him, we will meet him either as a faithful friend or as a holy and righteous judge. Now look, if I wrote the Bible, I wouldn't put that in there. But I didn't write it. The Holy Spirit did through his prophets and apostles. And Jesus himself says in Matthew 25, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and the angels with him, again, that Jesus talking about himself, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before them and he'll separate them as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats puts the sheep to the right and the goats to the left, and he says to those on the right, come you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But he says to those on the left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. There's no way around this. The idea of Jesus' return is heavy, and Jesus intends for us to feel the weight This is why he uses the strongest language that he can all throughout his earthly ministry to communicate the seriousness of this topic of judgment. But Jesus is not just a righteous judge. He is also a good shepherd. He is a good shepherd. And he desires that all should come to repentance. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather he rejoices with the whole host of heaven when one lost sheep returns home, no matter how far and how long that sheep has been running, no matter how dirty that sheep is, when it gets back, Jesus is a good shepherd. He's a good shepherd, and because of that, we all can have hope. We can have hope, and my prayer is if we stick this all out together today, the Holy Spirit would do his work in each of our hearts individually in whatever way we need, either conviction that leads to repentance or encouragement, inspiration and motivation so that we can all look forward to the coming of Jesus with hope and not fear. Because Jesus is clear. He's coming back. He's coming back. And of that day, in verse 32 of Mark chapter 13, he says, of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. See, Jesus doubles down on this feeling of urgency he creates by saying, oh, yeah, all that stuff about tribulation and trials, nobody knows when it's coming. No one knows when. No one. No one knows when. And that just adds to the pressure. It adds to the pressure. We all have experienced a pressure like this in some small way, I think. If you can remember being back in school and the teacher said, hey, look, I'm going to walk out of the classroom for two minutes. I want you all to stay in your seats. Don't talk. Don't move. Don't, don't do nothing for two minutes. What happens? Some of y'all remember. Well, me and my fifth grade brain and my little fifth grade friends just heard that we have a full minute and 45 seconds to wild out. We are definitely getting out of our chairs. We are definitely talking. We're doing all of those things. And we have 15 full seconds to run back to our desk, sit down, fold our hands, and welcome our teacher back with, welcome back, Miss such and such. We missed you. Like the sweet little angels that we weren't. But maybe you can't remember that far back, but you might have worked a job where something similar happened. Hey, the boss is coming through 1 p.m., all right? What they say. Make sure you 
look busy. <laughs> Make sure you look busy. It's coming through. 1 p.m., that one coworker that never does no work is just clickety-clacking on his keyboard like, well, howdy, boss, didn't see you there. You know me, just, uh, just staying busy. Because that little heads up, that's all that they needed to get their act together just in time. And many of us treat following Jesus the same way. I'll get serious about it when I'm older, when I'm married, when I have kids, when I'm on my deathbed. But until then, I'm going to do me. I'm going to live my life how I want. I'm going to put it off until the last minute. Some of y'all listening today, you have that plan. It's a bad plan. It's a bad plan for a lot of different reasons, but one, we just read from the mouth of Jesus. No one knows when the last minute is. No one knows. That's what Jesus just said. And even if you think that you've cracked the code, if you think that what Jesus really meant when he said that no one knows the day or the hour was that no one knows except you and your favorite televangelist that you watch at 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> if you've cracked the code, fair enough, I'm not even gonna, I'm not gonna argue with you. Kudos to you. But you might meet Jesus tonight. I might meet him tonight. Tomorrow is not promised, and we never know when our last day, when our last breath, when our last minute is. We cannot put it off until the last minute. This is as urgent and as serious as anything could possibly be. This is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, listen up. And now that he's got us all leaning in, he's talking about judgment and tribulation. He says, oh, no one knows when the hour is coming. And we're all leaning in. Lean in just a little bit for me. Thank you, gotcha. Lean in just a little bit for me. We got some time. Just, just a little bit. Just one more person. Lean in. Thank you. I'll see you. Jesus says, and we're like, hey, what should we do? He's like, hey, live ready. Live ready. Live ready. Be awake. Be alert. Always. He's warning us against what author and theologian A.W. Tozer calls spiritual lethargy. Spiritual lethargy. Tozer defines it as this, living on yesterday's momentum. Mm. Living on yesterday's momentum. I used to be on fire for Jesus. I used to pursue him with everything I have, but now not so much. Now I'm a little bit bored in the presence of God. I'm going through the motions. I'm coasting. Maybe I'm the only one that struggles with that sin. But I'd be willing to bet I'm not. Jesus is saying, don't be lethargic. Don't put it off. Stay alert, always. And at this point, he gives his disciples the parable that we're looking at today. It starts in verse 33. He says, take heed, watch, and pray. For you do not know when the time is. It's like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants. When you read authority, think responsibility. Gave authority or responsibility to his servants and to each one his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. In the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster or in the morning. Lest, coming suddenly, he finds you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all. Watch. Jesus is saying, look, I'm coming back. No one knows when, so live ready. That's all you remember from today. Jesus is coming back. No one knows when, so live ready. That's the point of this text. And in this short parable, these short six verses, Jesus gives some insight as to what it looks like to live ready. In verse 34, Jesus says he gave, the master gave authority, responsibility to his servants, and to each one his work. We must work. We got to work. Jesus has given us a work to do. And it's not because he needs us. God is God. He can do anything that he wants all by himself. But most often, he chooses to do it through human activity. Jesus is still working, still reigning, still saving, still healing, still delivering. But he says, I want to do much of my work through your working. And far be it from me to refuse. Because when he comes back, I don't want to be the one he's, he catches sleeping. And y'all, it's so easy to do. It is so, so, so easy to do. Look, just one chapter after this parable in Mark 14. This is the night before Jesus is arrested to be crucified. 
He's already had the last supper with his disciples. He's told them, hey, look, I'm about to be betrayed. It's mere days after Jesus told them, watch, be alert, stay awake. And Jesus goes into the garden of Gethsemane to pray, to prepare himself to be crucified. And he brings with him his top three dogs. Inner circle, top three disciples, Peter, James, and John. And in verse 34, he tells them, hey, stay here, keep watch. And then Jesus goes away and he prays for like an hour. Comes back, finds them sleeping. He finds them sleeping. Verse 37, he says, Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you stay awake for one hour? Again, he says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And Jesus goes away again and he prays and he comes back. Catches them sleeping. He goes away a third time. He comes back. Guess what? You're catching a pattern by now. Sleeping. Three times he goes away. Three times he comes back and they're asleep. And in verse 41, he says, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. The son of man is delivered into the hands of sinners. And at that moment, Jesus was carried away to be crucified. And look, if it was possible for these disciples to fall asleep in the very presence of Jesus on the very night of his arrest, mere days after being warned, don't fall asleep. How much easier is it for us to fall asleep at the wheel? But church, hear this. There is work to do. All right. And what is that work that Jesus is calling us to do? Well, first, we're called to do the personal work of sanctification. The personal work of sanctification. It's a long word. I'll give you a minute. Sanctification is a word many of us might not be familiar with, but it's a biblical word, and it means the ongoing cooperative work between the Holy Spirit and the believer to progressively, step by step, transform the believer into the image of Jesus. That's also a lot of words. So very simply put, it is a believer growing in holiness, a believer growing in holiness. And as much as we may have heard that once you give your life to Jesus, it doesn't matter how you live or what you do, the Bible says otherwise. 1 Peter 1, verse 13 says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. And as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, be holy in all you do, for it is written... Be holy because I am holy. The I is God there. Be holy because God is holy. And if that sounds like a tough ask, it's because it is. It's actually impossible. But remember two things. We don't do this in our own strength or on our own. Jesus has given us the Holy Spirit to help us along the way. That's very important. The other important thing to remember is it's not about perfection. It's about Direction. It's not beating yourself up because you're not perfect immediately, but it's about growing progressively towards Jesus. What direction are we growing, however slow and inconsistent and messy it may be? No one does this perfectly. Nevertheless, we just read this. This is not a suggestion. It is a command. It is the will of God and the work of every believer that we are ready by being sanctified. We're also called to do the relational work of loving our neighbors. The relational work of loving our neighbors. We're called to love one another, to serve one another, to have compassion on those around us and to work for their ultimate good. You can't love Jesus and ignore everyone else around you. When asked what the greatest commandment was, Jesus replied in Matthew 22, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second one is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. We are to live ready by loving our neighbor. We're also called to do the missional work of making heaven full. The missional work of making heaven full. If you've been at Rock City for five minutes, you've probably heard this before. Because it's our mission here at Rock City to make heaven full because that is the mission of Jesus. It's the mission that we have been given. In Matthew 28, he makes it very clear. 
Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Make heaven full. Make disciples. And look, this isn't just the job of the pastors. This is all of our work to love people, to be sanctified, to make heaven full, to lead people to Jesus, to make disciples. This is work for all of us to do if we're to be found ready. There's work to do, but there are things that can derail us from the work if gone unchecked. And against those things, Jesus warns us to watch. We must watch. Watch out for those things. Mark 13, verse 33. It's the beginning of the parable. He says, take heed, watch, and pray, for you don't know when the time is. A man goes to a far country, left responsibility to his servants and to each his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. See, Jesus mentions all of the servants in the house, but he calls one out specifically, and that is the doorkeeper. His job was to watch. And yeah, he's to watch for the return of the master so he can open the door and can serve him and be ready for him. But he's also called to watch out for enemies and thieves and any unwelcome guests. And so we, too, are to actively watch out for unwelcome guests, things that can derail us from the call, from the work and the walk of faith, to keep us from persevering until the end. We have to watch out for these things if we are to endure. One of those things is deception. Deception. We have to watch out for deception. In verse 5, when warning his disciples about the coming tribulation, he tells his disciples something that's applicable still today. He says, take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will deceive many. And today there are many people who claim to have the real truth, many people who say the same thing that Satan said to Eve in the garden all those many years ago. They say, did God really say? Did he really say? Many will call into question the truth of God's word, claiming to have an alternative spin on the truth. I got a better truth. I've got a higher truth. They'll come in the name of Jesus and make us question the truth of God's word. Because Satan, our enemy, is the father of lies. He's very, very good at it. He's got a lot of practice. So it's much harder than we think to discern a lie from the truth. That's why it works so well. That's why he keeps doing it over and over again. So the author of Hebrews in chapter 5 says that solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Because it takes spiritual maturity and training and constant practice for our discernment to be sharp enough to even know the difference between good and evil, let alone resist the evil. It takes being well acquainted with the truth of God's word in order to recognize the lies of the enemy from far off before we inadvertently let them in the front door of our own homes. How well do we know the word of God? How, how much are we, are we watching and seeking out deception? It can derail us. It's a serious. Another thing that can derail us is despair. We just sang about it. Throw off despair because despair can derail us from living for Jesus. In verse 9 of Mark 13, he tells his disciples to watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you to councils, to be beaten in synagogues. You will be brought before rulers for my sake. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. Y'all, following Jesus is hard. There will be suffering, and many of our brothers and sisters around the globe know that all too well as they face down persecution and the threat of death each and every day. And we might not experience that type of trial, but we do experience trials. People may hate you. They may ridicule you. They may mock you. You may lose cherished relationships for the sake of following Jesus. And so we have to watch out for the despair that can creep in when we go through difficulties. Watch out for the creeping doubt that whispers in our ears, is this even worth it? Is following Jesus even worth the trouble that is causing in my marriage, the rift between me and my children, the fight against my own sin? Is it even worth it? The answer is yes. Amen. It is worth it. Following Jesus is never easy, but whatever it costs, it is always worth it. Yeah. 
Don't give up. Don't give in to despair. Watch out for it when it starts to creep in. But there is something more dangerous than difficulty for most of us listening today. Something that is more responsible for driving people away from Jesus than almost anything else in our day and age. And that is comfort. It's comfort and ease. In Luke's version of this parable, Jesus puts it like this. Be on guard so that your minds are not dulled from carousing and drunkenness and the worries of life, or that day will come on you unexpectedly like a trap. And the worries of life refer to the cares and the allures and the pleasures of this world. See, living for earthly pleasures, Jesus says, is a trap. It will dull our hearts and our minds. It's like spiritual anesthesia putting us to sleep. Because in our difficulty, I'm tempted to believe that I can't trust God. But in my ease, I'm tempted to believe that I don't need God. I don't need God, so I focus on maximizing my comfort now instead of clinging to Jesus for my very breath, as if my life depends on it, because it does. The rule is very simple. If I chase after an easy life, I cannot live a ready life. Because I'm telling you now, if you follow Jesus, he will demand that you give up much of your comfort and most of your convenience. Your life is no longer yours. So watch out for the slow drift of the heart that begins to value comfort over calling, that begins to value convenience over obedience to Christ. For what does it profit a man to gain the world but lose his soul? Watch out for the spiritual anesthesia of comfort and ease. And all this watching, all of this being awake and alert, it's not just for our own sake, it's also for the sake of others. See, the doorkeeper was to keep watch for any unwelcome guests. He was the first line of defense for everyone else in the house. If he said, you can't come in, they're not coming in. So the doorkeeper was the first line of defense for everyone else in the house, for all of the other servants in the house. And so we watch out for each other, not just for ourselves. I'm not getting into heaven and being like, I'm good. Y'all get like me. You get you some Jesus. No, you give them some Jesus. Watch out for each other. We're all in this together. So we have to help each other against deception by speaking the truth in love, against despair by praying for and encouraging one another calling each other out of our comfort zone and into a life of radical obedience to Jesus, even if that goes against our agendas and it's hard. We all need each other on this journey because Jesus is coming back and we want as many people as possible to be ready. At this point, it may seem like a lot to do this, a lot to do that, a lot of work. Some of y'all didn't expect this when y'all came to church this morning. Maybe you didn't know that following Jesus was this intense, that it required this much effort. But I do have some encouragement for you today. The encouragement is this, that your working will be fruitless. Your watching will be futile and you will be frustrated. Some of y'all feeling encouraged already. I don't know why. It's a little... It's a little weird. Wait for it, my guy. Um, Unless you are walking with Jesus. Unless you are walking with Jesus. If we attempt to do this on our own, we will fail. Jesus tells us in John 15, he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. You will bear much fruit. You will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing absolutely nothing. All of the work, the work of sanctification, loving your neighbors, making heaven full, not going to happen. Not without walking closely with Jesus. And it doesn't matter what it looks like in the moment. It may look like you're absolutely crushing it without Jesus, but soon and very soon that house of cards will fall unless you're walking with the one who holds it all in his hands.
You can't do the work of sanctification if you're not looking into the face of the one in whose image we are being conformed. How do we expect to love our neighbors if we're not learning the heart of the one who loves them way more than we ever could? How could we ever hope to make heaven full if we're not staying closely connected to the only one who has the power to save? Apart from him, we can do absolutely nothing. But with him, even the impossible is possible. Even the impossible is possible. So I want to leave you with a question. What would it look like if we lived ready? Not coasting, not drifting, not going through the motions. If each and every believer took seriously the work of growing in holiness and loving one another, Think about your life personally. What would your life look like if you knew the truth of God's word so well that you could recognize and reject the barrage of lies and confusion that are wreaking havoc on our society? What would your home look like if you took seriously the call to watch out for your family, to do what you can do to help them live ready? How much differently would you pray for them? How much more would you pray with them? Would you push through the awkwardness? What would this church look like? If we all realized how desperately we need God every second of our lives and we were willing to abandon all comfort for the sake of following Jesus, for the sake of making heaven full, what would this church look like? What would the world look like if every believer lived with the sense of urgency that Jesus creates in this text that we just looked at? What if we lived as if whatever, everything that we do actually matters, here and now and for eternity? What if we lived as if Jesus was actually telling the truth? Look, that's exactly the life that we are called to live in Christ. It's exactly the life that we are all called to live, but it is impossible. It's impossible if we haven't taken the first step of readiness, which is repentance. See, we can have hope in the second coming of Jesus because there was a first coming. He has been here before. And that time, 2,000 years ago, he came not to punish sin, but to pay for it. To pay for the sins of everyone who repents and puts their trust in Jesus. See, I can have hope as I look forward to Jesus' return and the final judgment of sin because I know that by God's grace, he has enabled me to let go of my sin and give it to Jesus. And Jesus joyfully took it from me as he hung upon that wooden cross and the righteous judgment of God was poured out on him. The innocent lamb of God judged guilty so that I, guilty though that I am, could be declared innocent. God has removed my sin so that I could embrace Christ so that when he comes again to cast all sin into the fires of hell, I will be nowhere near it. I can inherit the kingdom. I can live at peace with purpose and with hope to the glory of God. And so can you. So can each and every one of you if you just let go of your sin. It's killing you anyway. Let go of your sin and grab hold of Jesus. If you stop trying to run your own life and you run to Christ. If you do that, when you meet him, you will meet him as a friend. Every head bowed, every eye close. We're going to pray. If that's you, wherever you're joining us from, if you want to give your life to Jesus, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. You're not saved by this prayer. It's not a formula. You're saved by faith in Jesus. And this simply puts words to the faith that has been born in your heart today. But you can say this. You can say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Have mercy on me. I let go of my sin today and grab a hold of Jesus. Help me live for you. With every head still bowed, every eye closed, I wanna pray over the rest of us today before we continue with one more song. Lord, just as we have come to you in faith for our salvation, 
we wait and we work, we watch and we walk by faith, trusting that you are faithful to complete what you began. You are faithful to build your church, that you will sanctify us by your truth, that you will protect us, you will encourage us, you will equip us, you will empower us to live ready and to endure until we see you again. It is with hope that we eagerly wait. In Jesus' name, amen.